so uh, personally, but now we, I get your full presentation and all of you get that. So uh, I think we should shift to Lima okay. and then have a very nice discussion afterwards. So Javier, for you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm actually very happy to share with you tonight a subject that is very dear to me and I'm very proud of. So um, let's start now. Um, this, is, this is an extract from an indigenous text uh, from the 16th century that was transcribed by Spanish um, priests under the name of uh, Gods and Men of Warji. And this quote reads, as Pariacaca loved her very much, he promised her everything because he wanted to go to bed with her. I will turn these fields into irrigated land with water that will come from the river, he said to her. Pariacaca, the god who speaks, um, is this mountain and uh, the rate raises up to 5,800 meters. And it's part of a mountain range that are responsible for um, water in Tulima. And um, coincidentally, or, or not strangely, Pariacaca was the god of water. So um, this also uh, shows uh, a natural resource that even in the past was already considered so fragile that it depended on the whims of the gods in order for people to continue. Um, so in the next um, 20 minutes, I will introduce to you the subject of the canals of Lima, <clears throat> exploring the evolution, um, the role in the environmental sustainability of the city today, and the campaign to reclaim its memory and identity, its indigenous memory and identity, that is. Well, first, let's have a quick look at some images to put you in context what type of canals we're talking about. Um, and we can start seeing perhaps similarities and differences. Um, these, uh, the canals in Lima are most mostly covered and these are some of the very few examples that are still um, that you can still see them running through the city. And these <laughs> these are two spectacular uh, photographs um, because Lima is a desert. So um, this is actually the, the landscape created by the one of the canals just. This is the um, this here is the water intake behind is the river, so this is the beginning of uh, of this canal. And um, let's see some <coughs> basic facts uh, comparing. Well, it's just for reference. Um, so I hope my data on Amsterdam are, are correct, but you know, in Amsterdam. The uh, average rainfall per year in millimeters is 830, in Lima it's 7. Um, in Amsterdam, on average, you have 70 square meters of green areas per person. In Lima it is 3. Are the canals visible? Yes, in Lima they used to be visible, but now they are disappearing from the urban landscape. Are they part of the identity of the city? Completely yes, in Amsterdam. In Lima, no, not at all. Um, they are navigable here, not in Lima. And in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam, you know this better than me, canals perform several functions. They take the water out for defense, trade, transport. In Lima, they only have one function, bring the water in. So Lima is a desertic, um, well, it's a city of contrasts where 11 million people live. It's a city where it never rains. And um, it is then not surprising that it is in the richer parts of Lima that the, the city is green and it's the areas, it's the areas where the canals <coughs> have survived. Uh, the main river of Lima is the um, Rimac. Um, and the Rimac 
comes through the historic center. And you can see there the profile of a very famous church, um, the two towers of the church, San Francisco. And, uh, and this river is responsible for 90% of the drinking water in this city of 11 million people. Alas, the Rimac is not a mighty river. If we compare it, for instance, with the Amazon, which also originates in the Andes of Peru, on its way to the Atlantic Basin, um, the average um, water discharge of the Amazon River is over 200,000 cubic meters per second. The Nile, which runs through a, a desert, has an average over 2,800 cubic meters, and the Rimac 26. Now, um, this map shows um, the whole system of canals as it was until the early 20th century. So um, this is the Rimac River coming down from the Andes, goes like that, on its way to the Pacific Ocean. This is called the Bay of Lima. And uh, from here, we had four main canals or mother canals. One was the Ate, Surco, the Botica, and then the Magdalena that divided into different ones. So um, they, from these four main canals, we have a number of uh, smaller canals that are divided into primary, secondary, tertiary canals. And they vary in size, but they expanded, uh, they entered the territory until they covered uh, the whole desert, and uh, by the 15th century, um, they had managed to transform uh, a barren and desertic land into about 30,000 hectares of productive land. Um, and this is more, this corresponds broadly to uh, the main part, the central part of metropolitan Lima. So um, this is a map of Lima cut at the top and the bottom, but the area where these two canals I'm referring to uh, are working today is what is the blue area, which corresponds to the more consolidated uh, urban areas of Lima and also the, the oldest parts. And, uh, and both are coming from more or less an altitude of 170 meters all the way down to the ocean. Um, as for how they do their job, um, it's well, it's a cut originally, it's a cut to the river, and the, re the rest is gravity. You know, Lima has a progressive slope uh, towards the sea, and that is perhaps the main tool that allows for the water to, to uh, reach the land, because it used to be mostly the land used to be mostly irrigated by flooding. That has been changed in the last few years, but that was traditionally the, the way they did it. Um, so um, the canals now, originally they irrigated 30,000 hectares, but after Lima started to grow widely in the 1950s because of huge uh, um, numbers of um, people and processes of migration, everything that was green starts to go down under the cement. And uh, the two canals I'm talking about tonight, they irrigate 1,150 uh, hectares, which is equivalent of 80% uh, of the total green areas in central Lima. Um, that is equivalent of more than 700 parks in 17 of the 43 districts of Lima, where about 3 million people live. And um, for, I think, mostly many of parks are important, probably like for everywhere in the world. So all the, the, the biggest, most historic, most beautiful parks in Lima, they are all uh, irrigated by one of the two canals. 
Now, a little bit about the history and evolution. Um, due to, to the origin and the nature of the canals that they have to be in constant use, it is very difficult to uh, get a proper measure of their age. But in archaeology, they have another, another way to, to get the, uh, the antiquity of a canal. And uh, it has to do with this. We call them watas. And these are, this is typical of Lima. These are ancient uh, mud architecture, mud or adobe. Mm -hmm. And because it never rains, they have survived. Mm -hmm. So um, according to archaeologists is that uh, if um, these buildings exist there, away from the river, is because there was a canal. In some cases, there is still a canal nearby. In some cases, it has disappeared. But when the canal is there, they can more or less get an idea of how old it is. <clears throat> and uh, so in Lima, we have over 500 of these structures that have survived the oldest of which is about 4,000 years old. And uh, now in 2016, the National Water Authority carried out a uh, research and they came up with the, um, with the idea that the Surco Canal is probably the oldest and it may be um, about 4,000 years ago because this is, well, this is the river and here there is an archaeological site which is uh, 4,000 years old, Las Salinas, and they found traces of a canal, um, which is probably true. But the thing is, we make a difference between a canal and a system of canals. So in that sense, if it existed, it only uh, allowed for agriculture and building in that specific area. Then about 2,000 years ago, there was a culture called the Lima culture, that uh, they are supposed to be the first group that worked with a vision of territory. So um, archaeological evidence shows that it was them who started to uh, create a system of canals. So mother canals with uh, other small canals, and this allowed them to become independent from the river because when there was no system of canals, everything had to be around next to the river, either architecture or agriculture. But because they expanded their urban um, presence a lot and the agricultural um, presence also, so then we understand that that was because of the canals. So by the 15th century, just when the Incas arrived in Lima, <coughs> the task was finished. They had, through more or less 2,000 years, they had managed to uh, irrigate the whole of this area. Um, so, um, along, um, well, in order to create this system, of course, there was a body of knowledge that was part of it. Topography, um, climate, rhythms, uh, basic elements of engineering. But along with that, um, there is evidence also of how communities established relationships with the canals. There, there are songs, dances, festivals, um, a lot of them associated with the moment when the canals uh, used to be cleaned. And some of these have survived and they are still performed in the rural areas outside Lima. This particular picture is from um, the campaign we had. One day in the campaign we had, uh, the, there is an Andean priestess who lives in Lima, and she was very happy with our campaign, and she said, let's make um, a ceremony where we bless the canal and the water. So this is uh, one of those, um, it's part of that moment. Now, um, this is interesting because this is part of an exercise I did a few years ago. Um, I managed to, through an archaeologist friend of mine, uh, she told me what they had found in a mummy that is about 2,000 years old. Mummies in Peru, um, they, are, they used to be 
varied with um, lots of things they used in their lifetime and things they ate. So in this particular mummy, this is what they found. So my exercise was, I was curious to know how much our diet has changed in 2000 years. So I collected everything that was there and it's exactly what we still eat today. And um, so uh, you can see avocados, beans, chili peppers, peanuts, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes and so on. And then, uh, of course, during the colonial period from the 16th century, <coughs> new crops uh, were introduced, olives, apples, oranges, and above all, sugar cane, like this. So now it's all, this is part of the, this is a district of Lima, but this is from the 19th, from 1930. And uh, Juan Gunter was an architect um, in Lima who devoted his life to um, study the history, the evolution of the city, and he had a, a very unusual perspective of the continuity of uh, Lima through the times. And uh, for him, the canals are Lima's umbilical cord. Without them, the colonial city would not have survived, and without the colonial city, contemporary Lima would not exist. Now, after independence, very little changed. Um, these pictures are from the 1940s in Lima, and the canals were still visible, and they were still white. Originally, they were six meters wide. They started to, to become narrower and narrower. Um, now they are about one meter. And um, so these all, this is all now covered, and um, they disappeared from um, the urban landscape. And from watering, the, from being used for agricultural uh, purposes, now they only water parks and green areas in Lima. About the water management, um, during the pre-colonial period, um, water efficiency was achieved uh, through a system that had to be precise. And I think it's something similar to what happens here when you were talking about uh, the, the importance of a democratic system. The equality had to be uh, applied to this management system because it is such a fragile system. So they had to know who would receive water, how much, where, um, when, and for how long. Coincidentally, this is pretty much how the canals are managed today, albeit with a number of complications. And uh, so um, all the um, irrigation commissions in the country or water boards, they are all part of the National Water Authority and the Surco Watica Water Board is one of those. Uh, in, in the whole of Lima, there are 17 water boards. And um, they have to confront a lot of problems. Um, I just put three of them here. Uh, encroachment of private or public land, dumping of waste, route diversion without authorization. Now, historically, the water board had a very practical way of dealing with the canals, which was to bring the water where it was needed. They had no other consideration. So whenever they found a, a problematic situation, they just covered the, the canal. So it's running, running underneath. Here they have a problem with people that have um, invaded this area. So, um, they had to adapt, but to that extent, for instance, the Surco Canal, which runs for almost 30 kilometers from the river to the Pacific Ocean, um, 22 kilometers have com been completely covered or over. And this is the, um, the, the current map. If you remember, this was the original um, map that was existing until the early 20th century and the two that have survived, the Surco and the Watica, this is 
the map in the, by the water board. And this, you can see um, how they cover the city, or that part of the city. And um, they are cleaned twice a year with the different methods. And then in 2015, <clears throat> the Sustainable Development Goals and the New Urban uh, Agenda were launched. And the uh, Water Board thought, well, this is offering new opportunities for a new way of managing water. So they tried to incorporate some of the principles in those two documents that would be um, would be easily applied to the management of the canals, which include the recuperation of cultural heritage, sustainable management of water resources, protection and enhancement of biodiversity, support of urban resilience uh, by enhancing green areas. For the water board, this was completely new, as I said before. They had always been focused on just how do we take the water from here to there without any other considerations. So for them, it was actually quite something, a big jump in, in, in trying to modernize and keep up with what was happening around the world. And then in 2000, 2016, um, we launched the campaign, which was called Canales de Lima. 2,000 years watering life. And the most immediate objective was um, to secure recognition mm -hmm. of one of the canals, the Soko Canal, as natural, a national cultural heritage of Peru. But of course, it was also important to raise awareness about their environmental importance, to foster links between citizens and their canals, and to reveal their indigenous pre-colonial origin. So as part of the process, we had to prepare a document for the ministry where we had to explain a number of things. One of them is why we consider that the canal is heritage. And one of the reasons was because there was enough archaeological and colonial evidence that they were a pre-Hispanic creation, because there was uh, evidence that in the past, cultures had transformed the desert into valleys. And also because we were acknowledging that these canals um, perform a unique um, role in the environmental sustainability of Lima. And then the values we attached to our um, petition was that these, these canals have a historic value, cultural value, environmental value, and the value of the territory. <clears throat> now, um, the campaign um, well, in the eight months that officially lasted, um, it, it was kind of intense. Uh, over a hundred stories were published in national and international media. Um, we organized 25 meetings in um, local auditoriums, municipal um, spaces, explaining people why we were doing this. As, as the campaign continued to go, to, to grow, we had um, activists, uh, urban activists, um, um, people of different kind, artists. I don't know if Susanna Baca is well known here, but uh, she's one of our uh, most important Afro Peruvian singers. So there, there was a lot of support coming from different groups of citizens, which kind of added momentum to the campaign. So in October uh, 2016, we, um, this is the day with the president of the water board, we went to the Ministry of Culture to um, uh, give our um, documents where we were explaining why we, had, we needed to have this canal declared as um, heritage. And there we started a very interesting process talking with ministry officials. And at the beginning, 
it was quite something because some of them quite openly said to us, you know, we cannot declare this heritage. We only declare heritage what is monumental. And <laughs> they were looking down to the canals as if, you know, why do you bring this to us? <laughs> uh, luckily, that vision changed, uh, but it made the whole process a bit longer. And, uh, and our legal arguments at the beginning did not work, so we had to uh, work again. And then it's about that, at that time when we learned about um, the UNESCO's recommendation from 2011, uh, historic urban landscape, where they make an, an, a revision of how to consider heritage in um, very fast um, urban developments everywhere around the world. And we thought, wow, that's what fits our case, because this was precisely what was happening. How can we preserve the canal in this city that is growing widely without planning, that is very, in some cases, um, aggressive growth? So um, we sent another document to the ministry, and we also um, found um, a UNESCO document from 1994, which was a report on Heritage Canal. Anyway, so two and a half years later, <coughs> we um, achieved our goal. It was um, declared um, National Heritage of Peru. And, uh, and to close the uh, experience, we published this book. And if we were to judge the success of the campaign by the number of people who attended the launching, we would say, well, that was a huge success. But that's not the last picture. <laughs> um, this is um, this was actually a very beautiful image. It's the first time we saw that in Lima, because nobody had ever photographed the roots of the canal. And this is one of the canals that reached its uh, last point on, uh, on its route from the river to the ocean, and it goes down the cliffs of Lima to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, so, although the main objective uh, was achieved together with raising awareness about um, the, uh, the issue of the canals, the final result is not perfect because there has been progress and setbacks. One shortcoming of the campaign is that we did not reach the most problematic areas. This was partly because most of it unfolded in the media and social media, and to which many of the persons who lived in these areas have no access. Um, and organizing public meetings in, um, in the areas where they lived proved almost impossible to, to organize. Consequently, um, many of the original issues there continue to exist. Then at the level of the narratives, um, it was important for me at a personal level to make this effort in reclaiming the indigenous memory and identity of the canals because a lot of people thought they were rivers because they were never part of the official narrative of Lima. Nobody knew that this was a legacy from the ancient inhabitants of our land of a territory. And uh, so this was important in a city that hardly ever um, made an effort in recognizing the indigenous input to the existence of the, uh, of the city. So beyond academia, where they had already written about it for many years, beyond academia, uh, a, narr a complete narrative of the campaigns did not exist in the public domain. So until this campaign, and this is what I've been sharing with you today, this, this whole narrative from the beginning to today. Um, at the water management level, some fundamental changes are underway. The main one relates to the fact that Lima is a very vulnerable city to climate change. And in the last few decades, over 50% of the glaciers that feed Lima and other cities, they have melted. And that process is unstoppable now. Uh, at the same time, every year Lima produces around 500 million cubic meters of uh, wastewater. 
And of this total, 80 million is treated and discharged into the sea. On the other hand, the water provided by the two canals, um, on average, is less than 20 million cubic meters per year. So the organization is now working to achieve a far-reaching change. That is to stop using water from the river and use instead treated wastewater uh, for parks and uh, green areas. It will probably take some time. Things take time in, in Vietnam. Uh, but at least the, the, the focus has already changed. So uh, finally, <clears throat> working with a vision of a common destiny in Lima seems more necessary now than ever to meet the inevitable challenges the city will face. And if in the past the fate of the people depended on the whims of the gods, today it probably rests on a healthy dynamic between authorities and citizens. So, well, thank you. That's, uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I think this story, I find it very inspiring. You, you taught us before about the facas and now about the channels and actually by yourself or with this group, you showed changing the narrative for 3 million people living there. I think it's a, it's a great achievement and, a, and yeah, it's an astonishing story. And another remark, I'm very happy that things like uh, UN Habitat System and even uh, the things done by UNESCO actually are inspiring th things on a local level as well, because sometimes I have the feeling this is just a paperwork for maybe uh, somewhere in Paris or, or New York, or we, we have to inspire the leaders, but also you are taking it from the ground up projects and using it to reach out to government. And I think that's also, uh, yeah, for people involved in this kind of work, it's also uh, good to see that you make good use of that. Um, and any any questions from our audience? Um, of course, okay. I have questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In Lima, there are two other uh, rivers, uh, Canta and Lurin. Do they also have this? Uh, kind of... and Lurin. They do have um, smaller canals because in the past the canals covered a much much larger area. Um, but they are, a lot of them have disappeared, especially if Lurin still has some canals, but nothing like the system that was developed in this part of, of Lima. And do you think that that is why they, the Spanish chose uh, the capital to be there? Well, according to Juan Gunter, this architect, yes, um, because the um, the Spanish found a system of canals, roads, agriculture, water. So, you know, the basis for a city was there. So, yes. Although, if you ask many people in Lima, they would say, no, it's down to the Spanish conquistador Pizarro, that we owe everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. A very interesting story. <clears throat> My question is how old are the water bodies? <clears throat> when were they started? The, officially, they started around 1950. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. but uh, with that name, the thing is, they, they never stopped working, the people who were in charge of the canals. So after, during the colonial periods, um, it existed under a different name. Um, after independence, progressively things started to be managed by the state. Yeah. The organization continued, exists, existed there. Mm -hmm. But as a water board, as we understand it today, as part of a national water authority, I, I think it's mostly from the 1950s. And even the colonial, or even pre colonial, there was already a form of organization. Totally. Yes. So would totally. you call that as a, as a precursor of water board? Well, some people, um, I know a, an archaeologist in particular, who believes that the way we manage the canals is 
this uh, complete legacy from pre-Hispanic pre times because the functions are exactly the same. Oh, wow. Yeah, the thing is that officially this has not been recognized. Is it possible to write that story? Yeah, I'm talking about, you know, recommending you <laughs> on this point uh, because here I hear from my friends in the water boards that our water boards also have been reinvented every few years. But uh, they are not that old. No, but I mean, that's the question. Are they maybe even more old, older than our? In the formal sense, no. But in the informal sense, what are not being saying is that they're not much, 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 much older. <coughs> exactly. And ours are only, it's not, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Then it, it makes even more sense. Yeah. The territory of Lima, what we, are, what we understand as Lima today, when the Spanish arrived in the 16th century, they found that it was divided in different groups. So it, each group had a lord. Mm -hmm. So that's why some archaeologists believe that you know, the canals propitiated a period of peace because if they were warring with each other, it would have been so easy to you know, and start blocking the canal and ruining everything. Mm -hmm. But it was actually, it, it, it was flourishing when the Spanish mm -hmm. arrived. Incredible. Yeah. What you're saying is incredible. Yeah. I'm asking you, please write that story. You know, in 2002, yeah. January, Kofi Annan said the next word will be about water. He changed his mind in six months and he said water is a medium, medium for cooperation. Six months. Why? Because a professor in Oregon, Aaron Wolf, had shown the historical data that out of thousands of water conflicts all around the world, very few, if any, led to war. That's what you're saying as well. Yeah. This is hope. Huh? This is about hope, hope through water, which is life. So please, I'm asking you very seriously. You'll make a deal. You'll make a deal before you leave the building. Okay. <laughs> the deadlines and everything. Yeah. This is an okay. incredible story. Yeah. Any, any other questions or remarks? Yes. I have a question about the six meters wide canals, uh, and now they are one meter, and uh, also it's very densely populated and built just on the edge of the canal. So, are there any differences in the volume of water that is streaming through the canals, even though it's not raining in Lima, but it's probably raining or snowing uphill? How do how do people deal with the difference of the volume? <coughs> Of course, with uh, climate change, uh, there are um, years when it rains massively up in the Andes, which means that the rivers come down with extra amounts of water. And I am, I'm not an expert in, in that. Um, it's all about the questions I asked to the people from the water board. And I understand when, that in those days, when, when there was, when there is uh, excessive amounts of water, they just close the, the water intake because there is a risk that they end up uh, flooding everything else and actually not performing their, their job as they, as they should. There's never a problem. Yeah. Or, yeah. Right. To, to keep it, to, not, yeah. to let, not to let it go to waste to the ocean, mm -hmm. so to keep the fresh water in spongy, spongy <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I suppose it is. <laughs> there is no, there is no, uh, no reservoirs to, to, to get the, the, the surplus uh, for later. There is no surplus. No, no, no. 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 Okay. There is no we need it every yeah. drop we get. Yeah. yeah. It's all used. Yes. yes. Yeah. But what is interesting is because, well, this is my understanding of the situation, because they were never part of a narrative of a city, then the, the authorities and the water authorities never understood the importance for a city where it never rains. Mm -hmm. So in Lima we have two massive plants for treating water that goes to the ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you would have imagined that as you saw in one of the pictures, the majority of Lima is kind of a brown color. 
because it has no water, it has no parks. This is middle class Lima where you find the parks, but this is kind of a bubble. You know, outside, the canals have been destroyed. And what's the source of the drinking water? Is that also the same river? The river, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And that's always enough? No, no. Lima has, uh, is also a very water-stressed city. And uh, middle-class Lima gets 24 hours a day water the whole year. But the poorer the neighborhood, the less hours they get water. So there are parts of Lima where they only get one hour per day, or two hours every two days. And um, so it is a same decision, yeah. Especially the, the, the new areas, the recently uh, invaded areas, they, they get uh, water from, because they don't have connection, they get water from trucks. Mm -hmm. So very little water. Yeah. Actually the consumption, uh, per capita is low. Yeah. They, they pay, pay the highest price per liter. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And also in the summer there is scarcity. <coughs> For example, it is forbidden to to water the lawns yeah, and yeah. those kind of things. But at the same time, Lima is one of the cities in the world with the largest average of wastewater. Um, if I'm correct, for instance, the richer districts of Lima, they consume about 490 uh, cubic meters of water per day. And in Amsterdam, I think it's 130. And liters, liters per person per day. Liters, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and the differences are vast yeah. in yeah. terms of access to water. Yeah. Have you, what about um, the, the, the narrative for, or the identity maybe of the, of the city of Lima as a whole? So you, you presented to us over the past few months two projects which have reached out to many people and have been uh, astonishing actually I would say, showing the pre-Columbian uh, uh, yeah, underlayer at least, or, or life even which brings, uh, which, are, which is the basis of Lima. How, how is the city an average perceived? Is there a change or is it too small a uh, project? How many, how many people have, do you think of this fast city has, uh, are changing or is there a process of change towards understanding this city as a product of not only the Spanish? Uh, well, the thing is, the colonial gaze is very strong in Lima. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's very difficult for people to accept that there is an important indigenous input in the past. Having said that, um, at least from, um, you can see growing signals of uh, awareness because in universities now they are studying more these sub the subjects. Some theses are being written either on the canals or on the workers. Um, there is slowly something that is changing. <clears throat> of course, it's not big or, or drastic, but compared to a few years ago where nothing happened in terms of even the canals, uh, it, is, it is quite remarkable that that is happening now. Yeah. Just keep starting a process. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. 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 Also, in terms of functionality, you would think that uh, canals could also be expanded again. Well, that's interesting, very interesting, because um, what we have is what was built in pre-Hispanic times. During the colonial period, they didn't um, add anything, um, and during the Republic, less. So, um, and the future could be... Well, people say that if they were to do that now, would be so immensely expensive that they don't even dare to do it. Yeah. Is Machu Picchu not an excellent example of how it should be with water management? Yes, but Machu Picchu is up in the mountains, so it rains there all the time. But um, it is an example of uh, um, hydro hydraulic engineering that is quite remarkable. 
Um, but I think there they dealt with other issues because they, they do have a lot of water. But this is snow melt. It's fed by snow from that yes. sacred mountain. And yeah. what is climate change doing? Is well, there any impact already seen? Yes, um, half of the uh, glaciers have melted down already. On the sacred mountain? On that mountain range. That you saw. Yeah. That you saw. yeah. Yeah. Even that high, it also melts. Yes, yeah. and these are called tropical glaciers. Mm -hmm. Ninety percent of the tropical glaciers in the world are in Peru, and half of them have already melted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the next twenty years, Lima is going to have a lot of water because you know oh, it's the rest. melting process. Yeah. But the problem was it's going to be after twenty years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it is a serious situation. But the thing is, <clears throat> two percent of um, how is it called? Sweet water. Fresh water. Yeah. Um, is on the coast on the Peruvian coast, but seventy percent of the population live on the coast, and ninety-eight percent of the water goes to is on the other side of the Andes, and that goes to the Atlantic Basin. Um, there are a huge number of rivers, so what they, have, what they have been doing in the last few decades is try to divert some rivers to, um, towards Lima. But of course that is creating problems with the communities up in the mountains, because they want to keep the water. It's much time I try to do. You okay. said Amsterdam is a tragic story. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're speaking about yeah, 20 years. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think we have to keep an eye on uh, during our lectures on what might be a good place to migrate to at some point. And I think for tonight, I think, uh, of course, there's still some time for you to uh, to exchange ideas and also to make to. Uh, to make sure there's deadlines for you to write something, as I understood. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you so much, uh, both of you. And, and I would like to thank you with a big applause for all of you. Uh, and, and I myself, I really like the topic of water and heritage, but I work more on, on building level, actually. But in a, se in a sense, it's the same. You have to see what we got from the past, what are the good bits which we like to work upon and which we like to excel to the future. So uh, this is the same thing you're doing in water level, but then on building level, it's mm. reuse and redevelop and redefine on you. the building level. So Excellent. as a token of our thanks for your great uh, contributions. Great. And, oh yes, oh yes, there was also some something we have to do. Is, is it? No, no. Where is it? <laughs> there was some gift, some gift to the audience. Uh, which is uh, which uh, they wanted to give, and then we had the problem how to do it, how to do, we could do a lottery and a quiz, and I thought it would be a bit too complicated. So what we did is we photographed. I said, okay, you tell me which which chair will be the winner, <laughs> and, and I'm a medication. It's, it's you. You you are you are the winner. <laughs> this is the proof. This you are the winner of this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes, uh, one more thing. Uh, we are now into our summer holiday on the, the e-commerce lecture, so we'll be back on September. Uh, it's always the second Wednesday, apart from this one, because it's fuzzy, but normally second Wednesday of the month. And we'll inform you whether you have to sit at home using your laptop or you're invited here and we have dinner again. So 